everybody welcome all right so yeah today is all about developing a unique sound uh, so think of this as like in the style category of practice and it's sort of like the big broad picture of like what kinds of stylistic things can you do uh, and what do you trend towards as a singer and how can you develop something that's unique to you that feels good as you sing uh, so always as we're doing this it's a process of exploration uh, and whenever we're exploring things with our voice, we always just want to be have like a, a few sort of uh, brain cells towards how does it feel? Is it something that uh, is lasting and sustainable? Or do I find myself having a lot of uh, trouble recovering from whatever I'm doing? So always check in and be like, how does that feel? And sometimes there's a delay effect with our voice. Um, just like with other physical activities, you might start to notice it a little later. And that's an indicator that maybe your voice is just not used to it. So some of this, right, is just conditioning over time and getting comfortable with certain things. So we all have natural predispositions sort of towards certain vocal qualities and styles. And a lot of the time I'm teaching how to bring our voice into balance so that we can understand what we're doing and be in control of it. But that doesn't mean that we always have to have a perfectly centered and even voice. Um, that's just the practice of having control. And then once you do that, you can start to break the rules, so to speak, and develop a, a sound that's unique to you or whatever you're working on. Um, it's also important to note that like a lot of what makes a uniqueness of sound is also what we do musically. Um, so instrumentation, um, you know, all of these kinds of things, the, the style of music that we're, we're um, singing is going to help influence a lot of what happens. Uh, but this is the idea here. We're talking about what it means to have a unique sound uh, and how we can go through a process of sort of getting a sense of what uh, our voice is doing uh, and if we want to modify that. So the way that I like to do this is always setting up a system because it can seem like, where do I begin? You know, do I just start making really weird sounds? Um, yeah, you could do that. Uh, that's part of it. Some of it is listening right to other things. Uh, and getting a sense of what's out there. And then, you know, over time, what I've found is I can start to categorize sort of um, these binaries or two opposite sort of part features of a voice. Uh, and then just getting a sense of where I like to sit on that sort of spectrum and then practicing going back and forth. And ultimately from there, settling in on the kind of sound that I want. So I think, you know, this is, this is really what's exciting about the voice is it's, um, it's kind of like a chameleon. We can do a lot of different things and imitate a lot of different sounds. Uh, and so we can use that to our advantage. Once we have good vocal technique, we have freedom and flexibility to explore these options and we don't get stuck in something uh, in particular. And a lot of the time, what's the case is because just the nature of our body, we tend to get stuck in kind of the same types of patterns that uh, other people do. And so sometimes we end up kind of having a a more homogenous sound. And so finding uniqueness is, is part of this process of creativity and exploration, uh, but also just giving you a map to start playing with. And so this is where, you know, it, it gets weird because it's like, how do you develop a unique sound? You have to find it yourself and decide aesthetically what you like. Um, and of course, some people are not gonna like that aesthetic, but it's about what feels good uh, and what fits with the kind of music and the, the poetry or the lyrics that you're singing or the absence of lyrics, we'll talk about that too. Sometimes people just sing random things, right? And they don't actually use words and that can be part of what makes your sort of unique stamp on things. So let's start going through the process of some different sort of things that we can modify with our voice. Uh, and then, you know, as you're doing this, you can just start to take note of like, what are the things that I tend to do? And, um, you know, one really great thing that stuck with me, um, one music teacher taught me this at one point when we were talking about style. Um, yes, there's what we do organically, and that's really, really important. Eventually through practice, we start to make something more organic, but really a lot of the time what makes uh, an artist really interesting is the choices that they make and having choices that you're making and being intentional about it, at least in your practice um, until it starts to become second nature again. So. This is this process of sort of refining down what you want to do with your music and the kinds of sounds that you want to make. Um, so the first sort of um, binary or opposition that we can work with is a breathy or a ringing or strident tone. Uh, and so I, you know, I always want this to be hands on. So a lot of this is going to be feeling out this interplay of opposites and noticing where you lie. 
Uh, and even, you know, even if you do do it in a certain way, being able to do the opposite will just give you more control over what you're actually doing. Uh, and that I think is the path towards having your own intentional, unique sound. So with breathiness, one thing that I'll work on first is literally our, our breath support. And so there's this uh, sort of opposition between a more relaxed breath support where we're letting more air escape. So this is thinking like fogging the mirror. Uh, and then there's the other side, which is having a more pressurized um, breath where less air is escaping. And of course, if we go too far on either side, we can run into vocal issues. So we just want to note that like oftentimes on the extremes, uh, it can be a little more fatiguing. And so usually we want to fall somewhere within those two extremes. Um, too breathy and you're going to lose all pitch and all of that kind of stuff. And then too strident and you might be really forcing and getting too hard or too piercing. Um, again, depends on the kind of music that you're doing and the effect that you want to have with people. Uh, so you can try this out with me. The first one is just trying to make warm air and this is fogging the mirror. And so we're going like, I'm still trying to focus on evenness and this is going to make it more musical so that we're not just letting all our air escape. And the other side is thinking about a more sealed space, like a TS sound and engaging your lower abdominal muscles and going like, so you can play around with these two things. Now let's put it directly into the voice. So, you know, I might just pick a random pitch and I'm going to try and go from breathy to more strident and back and forth. And this will help you understand what I'm talking about too, right? And then take note, like, does my voice do this? Are there singers that I like who are who fall on one side or the other? Uh, and you'd be surprised, right? Some people get really irritated by too breathy of a sound. Some people get really irritated by too strident of a sound. And it just, you know, it just uh, is a matter of taste a lot of the time. So, uh, and, and if it fits the music that it's in. So I'll go like, uh, I'm just trying to see if I can come on and off of that, right? You can pick back and forth. You can take breaths between it and see like, can I make a more strided sound? Can I be like, oh, there's more of that ring in it, right? Oh, and the really the trick here is do you add an H? And H is going to give you more of that breathy sound, or do you try to get more chord compression and a more sealed kind of sound? So we think of chord compression, we think of that glottal sound, like, uh, uh, uh. My chords are coming together a little more versus, uh. So that's the first thing to sort of play around with. Um, and all of these things will start to kind of add up together into a sound. Um, a lot of the time, especially just as you're singing a melody and you're getting expressive. And sometimes it's a matter of your ability to go back and forth between these two things. So it's not like, oh, I have to pick one set option. Um, some singers are really defined by their flexibility and sort of dynamic expression, right? So um, it's a simple little practice. You can put it on a click track. You can practice trying to go all the way from breathy to stride and back uh, and just, just play around with that. And you might notice that what's hard about being really breathy is it's hard to maintain that pitch. So you want to make sure that you're when you're picking a pitch that you don't start to drift down, right? Uh, and then same thing with when people are getting too strident, sometimes they end up going sharp. And this happens when we're, we're nervous a lot of times, right? So we'll be like, kind of going above the pitch. So try to stay on that single pitch and just only change breathiness to a more strident or ringing sound. So again, one more time, it's like, just pay attention to what it feels like that's the really weird thing with the voice um is as we observe it more we just are in more control of our proprioception or our ability sort of to control these internal functions that we don't necessarily have like a physical cue for the best way is to think about vowels and consonants so breathiness it's like an h sound uh, and then uh, more of a strident sound, we're going to think more glottal. So like uh, apple or like, you know, uh, we, we do this one where it's, it kind of naturally happens in speech where you go like, uh, oh, uh, and that uh, 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 strident versus uh, 
Um, you know, try this at where it's comfortable in your range. So this is, you know, doing it for like tenors. You might, for, um, for my upper voice singers, you might be up here and be like, ah. um, you could do it higher in your range, in your head voice. And, you know, do you have a very light uh, sort of breathy head voice or do you have a more strident head voice? So are you gonna be like, and just figure out if you can get back on either side of that. Um, so that's the first sort of uh, binary. Another one that we can talk about is um, nasality or non-nasality. So uh, with this one, it's all about your nose and your tongue. Uh, so, you know, and sometimes, you know, in the old school, we're like, oh, you need to avoid nasality, but that's 100% not always the case. Um, there's plenty of sounds that are really, really nice when they have some nasality, especially just depends on the style that you're singing. Um, so with this one, we're thinking about that twang resonance. We, you know, when we have a slightly more rigid tongue and we push it a little more forward, we get a little more nasality. Um, and sometimes when we pull it back, we'll get a sort of a more throaty kind of nasality. You can feel this by simply holding your nose uh, as you're singing sometimes. So I'll do something simple like this, right? And this is like in our, our country style singing where we go like, nya, nya, nya. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm literally just trying to sing through my nose a little more, right? So focus on that. And then if you want to make sure, like if I plug my nose and I'm trying to focus into that area, right? You're going to feel that sort of more honky tonk kind of feeling. So, yeah, 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 yeah. And then the opposite is to try to have non nasality. So relax the tongue. And as you plug your nose, you can do something where you go like, um, oh, 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 oh. and if you don't have any nasality, plugging your nose and not, uh, and keeping it open, there shouldn't be a big change. You might notice as you do this that all of a sudden your sound comes from a sort of further back in your head, and that's going to be less of that nasality. So nasality a lot of time is pushing towards the mask. So this with our and using our tongue a lot of the time. So like. Nya, nya, nya. There's also a little bit of constriction that we can kind of do here. You can kind of see that, right? It's like, nya, I, 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 I. So you can actually just check in with that by um, testing out the sensation with your nose. Um, do I have a nasal sound or not? Um, and no judgments here again. Like, uh, it's really cool how we can use our instrument. Uh, in so many different ways. And again, it's about the flexibility. And there's a lot of situations where nasality can just sound really, really awesome. Uh, and then there's other situations where it might not quite fit. So sometimes what I'm thinking about is just how do I shape my instrument for whatever I'm about to do and have something that's that's specific, right? I'm making choices of like, oh, it's this kind of style. And this is the way that I like to sing that kind of style. Uh, and then to go from there, right? You know, you can maybe hybridize things a little bit and everything that you sing is going to influence your voice. So that's one of these. Uh, so we've got breathy to ringing or strident and we've got nasal to non-nasal. Um, we also have vibrato, right? This is a huge uh, sort of calling card on people's voices. Sometimes it's a physical thing, but you can learn eventually to control your vibrato. Uh, some people just have sort of a set type of vibrato because of the way that they sing. Um, and your ability to come on and off of your vibrato also gives you a lot of sort of dynamic range and control. So with this one, um, vibrato is always a product of healthy singing, space, and spin. And we, when we have just the right sort of balance of pressure, our uh, muscles here start to oscillate and we start to get sort of a, a change in the format as it sort of oscillates back and forth. So vibrato, right, if I'm like, oh, uh, that's like an even vibrato. Everyone can kind of find this at a certain point. Um, there's lots of exercises for helping find your vibrato. A lot of the times it's about changing directions. So going like, hi, 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 and you'll find it sort of at the, the very end of your phrases a lot of the time. Sometimes people don't even realize that they're, they're actually um, creating vibrato in certain situations. But just like what we did with breathiness, can you come on and off of your vibrato? Can you go like, uh, 
blocks of practice. Um, so you might notice, oh, I only do straight tone sounds all the time, or uh, and that's yeah, it's not a bad thing. Um, or I'm always adding vibrato all the time, uh, and I just find that you can you can really create like really interesting, cool little brush strokes with vibrato. It often comes in with expression when we're sort of leaning into our voice a little more. Um, and the other thing is we actually can control the rate of our vibrato. And this is where a lot of people have like a unique sort of sound. Uh, do they have a flutter or a wobble? And this is about that rate of vibrato. So an even vibrato, just like what I showed going like, oh, right, it's kind of flapping at the same, same rate. Now we can work on flutter and vibrato by playing with the space and our pressure. So I think of using diphthongs, um, so like going Y or um, hey, and as we're collapse, for example, like if we want to flutter, which is a faster vibrato, um, as I'm singing, I will collapse the space and it will start spring load my vibrato. So you can practice this too uh, and just be like, hey, hey, and you get it to sort of get a little more rapid, hey, why? And you can get that sort of dovetailing kind of sound where it happens a lot in jazz or like, yay, whoa. And I'm just letting it collapse as I do it. And I'm not putting in a lot of force. I just think, you know, I first have to be able to do vibrato uh, and then I start to contract the space. So listen to singers that you like and note like, what's their vibrato like? What's my vibrato like? Do I have vibrato? Can I control the rate? The other side is the wobble. Um, a lot of times people talk about flutter and wobble as like vocal issues. Um, I just think it's also style control, right? So technique and style are, are um, sort of intricately connected. It's just a matter of like, are you in control of it? Or is it like the fundamental in your technique and you can't get out of it? If it's codependent with breath support, with getting in tune, you know, like, are you hiding the fact that you're not really sure of the pitch by putting in a really wide vibrato? That's a more codependent sort of technique issue compared to like a specific choice that you're making. So a wobble, we want to think of the opposite thing. We are um, we are going to relax our support and open the space. And so you can use a similar thing like wah, wah, wah. And you're just practicing trying to get that range a little wider, um, like open. And then you can often put these two things together. So what's cool is a lot of times people go like, hey, why? And they'll go like a little wider and then they'll come into more of a flutter. Uh, it happens when we're getting really expressive. Uh, so that can be something that you can play around with. You might be a singer who's always going like, yeah, hey, why? And just adding that sort of um, in and out of your sound. So that's also something that's a, a unique calling card for singers. Like, oh, I you know, do basically just straight tone singing all the time. Or I'm adding, I have a distinctive flutter in my sound. There's lots of pop singers who naturally have a flutter because of the nature of having just needing a smaller sound shape for, for pop music compared to when we have like a big broad sound and we might get more of a wobble. Um, so in certain classical moments, you could have a really wide vibrato that's not wobbling too, right? Like, so it's just a matter of like how the size of your vibrato, are you like, Oh, right in that full kind of big space, or are you? Oh, right, so a lot of it has to do with the shape and the opening of our mouth and our breath support and pressure. But ultimately, like, you know, you could get really, really specific about it. You just really have to explore the feeling of it and think about, like, what are my options? So that's that side of it. Um, we've got the straight tone, vibrato, flutter, and wobble. Um, another, you can see actually there's a lot of parameters and we're just getting started. There's even more. Um, we can also talk about bright and dark tone. That's a really uh, good one. So this has also has to do with vowel shape. So um, when we're thinking of a bright tone, we are thinking a little more narrow and spread. A lot of times nasality contributes to this. Um, they, they can kind of work together. Uh, and then when we're thinking of a dark tone, we have more of this sort of internal space. Some of this is a matter of like um, perception and perspective, but I think a lot of it has to do with uh, the vowel shape itself. So if I'm like, um, actually I do, I do an exercise to sort of expose this and it can work either way. Um, so I use these two vowels, cat and caught. So ah and ah, 
Um, so they're just a variation of um, the the ah vowel. One is more rounded with the lips and the other is more spread. So spread is going to get us a brighter sound. We tend to talk with a slightly more bright sound, at least in um, sort of like American English dialect. Um, so that tends to be more common compared to that round thing. And so the, actually this leads me to something I just wanted to explain. Uh, where you come from, the languages that you speak give you slightly different options. And I really love singing in different languages. And this is something I highly recommend to people because it'll just give you a slightly different palette to work with. Um, and that's often also what you know gives people a distinct sound is like they're a native Spanish speaker or you know come from the UK or it's whatever it is um, that you're gonna have a certain quality to your sound. And then sometimes it doesn't influence people's singing voices. Sometimes uh, when people sing, they have an accent that they don't necessarily use when they talk or it gets sort of evened out in certain ways. So just something to pay attention to, like, do you hear an accent? And um, do you have an accent? Um, and so bright and dark can sometimes be uh, related to this as well, but you can also modify this stuff and sort of find your spectrum. Hi, welcome. Um, yeah, so with this one, I use cat, caught, cat, and I do them back to back on our simple pattern. And let's say I'm going to try to get my ah to sound brighter. So it's like my ah. So this is sort of the, the concept here. I'm going like cat, caught, cat. So I'm getting that slight little uh, curl here, right? Cat, caught, cat. That's going to be my bright sound, right? you flip it around, try to make your ah like your ah, and go like, cut, cut, cut. Or you could go, cut, cut, cut. And you see, I have a slightly dopier shape, slightly more rounded lips. Um, sometimes when we're trying to get that sort of space, we talk about like the dopey sound or going like, ba, 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 ba. So a lot of times when I think of dark, I think of just a looser, kind of more relaxed space back here with a little bit of palate lift. So that yawny sensation of, oh, right, if I'm singing more classical, I'm going to go that way. I'm more contemporary, I might be like, oh, and get a little more of that sort of mask. So you know why I talk about like doing the whole humming vowel work working with um, feeling sort of the different formants of resonance along your palate. This is that control. It's a toggle of like, can I sing into my mask and my nose, or can I try to get uh, resonance from this sort of space back here a little more? So even when I'm going like, I'm, I'm really trying to play with the overtones and see if I, and see if I can get sort of to move in different places around my face. Uh, and that's, I think, a lot of where we get the concept of bright and dark is like, where are you more dominant? Are you pushing a lot of sound forward this way? Or is the sound feeling like it's coming out the back of your head? Um, so bright and dark, bright is a little more metaphorical, perhaps. Um, that's why I sort of say it's a it's a matter of aesthetic and a little bit of perception, because oftentimes I'll find a voice is a, a mix of bright and dark, right, depending on what we're doing. And sometimes um, there are some singers uh, that will make that rapid transition from one to the other, and it creates some really cool effects. Sometimes they'll even use a little technology to make that extra obvious. Um, but that can be a really, really cool thing is like your ability to sort of move back and forth. Um, so as always, with all of these binaries, it's not just like, one or the other, but actually how you sort of flick back and forth and the decisions you make. Like maybe when you go to the chorus, you always go to a light breathy thing. Whereas sometimes people, when they go to the chorus in their song, they want to go towards something more big and full and add vibrato. Um, so what are your predispositions? What are your inclinations? Um, that's the bright, dark sort of continuum. Um, another one is clean tone versus a grit tone or a fry tone. So are you adding distortion into your sound? Um, I'll start with the clean tone is the obvious thing where we're like, oh, there's nothing uh, distorting it. If I go like, oh, there's obviously something blocking, right? And that sort of um, 
and that's using fry. So when we think of fry, right, we think of very relaxed support. Air bubbles are escaping out of our vocal folds, and that creates a little bit of this sort of croaky, crackly kind of sound like a creaking door. So you can just, you know, some if you don't do fry a lot, it actually takes a second to feel it out and be in control of it. Just like any of these things, um, it might seem silly, play with it, you know, be light about this whole process. Sometimes as we're trying to like add some style into our voice, we just do some really weird sounds and things. It just takes a sec to get control of it. So try to go like, uh, yeah. and I actually like to go through the circle of vowels so that I can feel being in fry and all these different sort of vowel shapes. Like, yeah. And then just like what we did with breathy to ringing tone, nasal to non-nasal, you can actually practice coming on and off of fry, going completely to fry, almost where there's just no pitch, and then back into sound. So just pick that same uh, same note and be like, uh, trying to play around with that. So, you know, you might be like, I don't know how I'm making these sounds. Imitation is a huge power of the voice. Um, so just trust your ear, try to make the imitation with me. You know, you can understand the physiology to these things till you're blue in the face, but it's ultimately just about our mind body connection. So hear the sound, rinse, repeat, try to control it. Uh, sometimes get a mix of both where you're actually making uh, a pitch and you've got a little bit of fry hey, uh, and that's something that you actually can be really really cool um it's important to note often when people are doing these kinds of things it's not that we have that sound the entire time and you know go go and l use your ear and listen to some you know famous singers um rock singers, things like that, and note where they're putting in the fry. And you realize that like, if you do it in the wrong place at the wrong time, it sounds really weird. And then you put it in just the right spot and it sounds actually kind of cool. So I've, I've found this as I'm working through things and I, it's just muscle memory, right? We just rinse, repeat. We try to feel that out, just listen back, decide what we like, and then try to keep that muscle memory so that we we have that sort of relaxed entrance into something. So I, sometimes I'll do like a scoop and sort of a into a a, um, a, a warm up sort of um, interval routine. I'll be like, why, why, why? I'm gonna try to just get that sort of coming on and off of it. Why? And I, can I get it to kind of move through and just be silly about it? The more you can do that, the more control you're going to get. And the more likely when you think it and you feel it out as you're singing, it's going to do what you want. Um, and that's really sort of the goal with a lot of this is maybe it's important to sort of stop and say, like, this is a very like construction based style technique, which is like, what are elements of style? How do we work them so we have control? And then ultimately when I'm singing, I just want my intuitions to guide me. Um, that's one side of it. You can be very particular and sort of put them in. Ultimately, we, you know, when you're actually performing, you kind of have to feel it through, but our practice will make sure that we're gonna land close to where we want aesthetically. So, you know, this is it's very hard to try and think about all of these details like very consciously in the moment. Um, so we make our choices a lot of the times ahead of time and we practice it into our body. So that's where the practice really comes into play. Um, so that's the clean fry. Um, there's also grit. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned this in my last live stream when we we're talking about rock. You want to be careful when you're practicing with grit because it takes a while to get comfortable using false vocal folds and creating uh, distortion. So this comes from like um, using like uh, throat singing as a style. And so you can, um, the path to this is trying to clear your throat and then getting to a growl state, which is supported and uses high overtones. Um, so going, and it's very, very light. So you might find yourself coughing or getting some irritation, it means you're pushing too hard into it. So it's this feeling of like, <clears throat> and then we get, start to get that sort of sound. 
that's literally just throat singing what I was doing. So, you know, people would do like overtone singing, be like, um, when we're actually using this when we're singing, hey, hey, you might put in like a little bit of that kind of growl. You might notice some singers just naturally have this. Sometimes it's a uh, vocal damage and fatigue. Sometimes it's just a, because they've been doing that sort of style for a while and are in control of it. You want to be careful about this and make sure that it's not an indicator that you might have like nodules or something, right? So like when we, we talk about vocal nodules, vocal health, you see with all of this style stuff, we kind of have to talk a little bit about everything, technique, um, different sort of uh, genres, and also a little bit about vocal health too, and just sort of what's possible. Um, with nodes, what that means is you have uh, calluses that form on the vocal folds or little um, uh, sort of abnormalities like polyps and cysts and things like that. Uh, and they usually come from fatigue or friction and repeated sort of damage, getting hoarse a lot, and then, um, or and or like uh, blood vessels bursting, right? So bruising essentially of your vocal folds. And then over time, you know, our body's trying to make that area more resilient. And what it does is it disrupts our natural sort of waveform and we get that distortion. So like, um, yeah, yeah, awesome, good, 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 good. So like, um, you know, like you've got like, some singers who notoriously have a very permanent kind of grit sound to them. And that's often a physical reason. But what I was like, what I talked about last week, um, singers who can come in, in and out of it are most interesting to me because it, it means that they're intentionally picking a style. They're not codependent on it. Uh, and you're gonna have some versatility, you know, like Freddie Mercury, for example, can come in and out of grit, uh, and then come back to a clean tone. It takes a lot of practice. So even what I just doing right there, little tiny bursts of it, drink water, pay attention to how you feel. You might kind of get like a little um, tingly, kind of warm sensation, a um, little itchy, that kind of thing. It's it's a little bit of an extreme sport kind of a sensation. And ultimately it's about finding really, really a light form for endurance. Um, so you can think about, you know, where does my voice fall on the grit to clean tone? Um, can I add, you know, oftentimes grit singers will do both grit and vocal fry. And so when they're singing very light and relaxed, they're uh, doing a little more of that. And then, the, hey, you know, adding in a little more of that kind of rough sort of sound. You might also notice that breathiness is involved, right? Like a slightly more breathy, open, shouty sound is going to get a, create a little bit of that squeeze. Um, so all of these things start to kind of work like a little puzzle game of like, I need a little bit of breathiness, which is going to help me find a little bit of that vocal fry grit sound um, and make sure that I stay straight tone and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so you can get kind of heady like that. And or you can also just feel it out. Right. So that's the cool thing about the voice mind body connection. Some people really like to approach it from the mind. Some people really like to approach it from the physical sensations uh, and ultimately uh, a combination of both is probably going to be the best way around all of this. Um, so I also recommend like if you're like a rock singer, for example, try singing some classical music. If you're a classical singer, try singing some rock music uh, and, and often the genre, the instrumentation, all of these things are going to help you get to it. You know, the imitation is going to help you get to the right kind of sound uh, and use your ear. You know, like I love hearing like, you know, from all you like, have, do, do you have another binary that comes to mind uh, in terms of like two sort of opposite forces that you can sort of play around with on the spectrum of like, where do you lie? You could even write this out and try to, you know, do it for different singers and be like, what is the unique combination of sounds that makes that singer sound the way that they do? Um, so we've got all of that. Uh, I forgot to mention, you know, I was talking about the nasal stuff. We can also do this uh, sort of R, backwards R kind of sound, which we get in country. Um, it's uh, commonly like the Shakira kind of sound, right? Where, uh, 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 a little bit of that kind of thing. Um, so that's just leaning into your R and you get, well, you get kind of a certain overtone sound that um, is also a strategy. So sort of like a backwards twang thing. So twang can be used as well. Twang and nasality are kind of uh, very similar concepts. So that's also something. Um, and it's always just knowing how to do it in a way that doesn't block or impede like 
pitch accuracy or um, in terms of your vocal health, right? So all of these kinds of things. Uh, and that's what makes style hard is you kind of have to explore things that might influence your overall technique. Uh, and so I like to work on my like basic technique and find balance and then play around with options just so I make sure that I have flexibility and that I can get out of it, return to a normal state um, when, when I need to. Uh, so that's just really, really important. You do it a lot, you're going to start to kind of get to that more by default. It's a muscle memory kind of a thing. So there's that. Uh, there's still more. So uh, another one is registration, right? This is often when we talk about voice types, this is kind of that main classification. Yes, it's about our range, but it's also about where our voice uh, changes, where it cracks uh, from head to chest voice. And then it's also about what we prefer. So like um, a higher voice singer, like soprano, uh, is going to be more in their head voice and a lower voice singer like a like a bass on the other end is going to be probably more in their deep chest voice um some singers primarily only sing in chest voice some singers mainly only sing in head voice uh, and you'll often will get things in between so uh that's that thing are you a mixed voice kind of a singer are you someone who sort of lies between the two and uses a mixed voice strategy so chest voice, right? We think about like our speech register. So if I'm like, ma, 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 right? hey there, hey over there, right? That's that it's very speech-like register. Um, head voice is thinking about kind of our more sing-songy like thing. We feel it perceptively sort of in the back of our head or the absence of sensation in our chest, right? So this is why we call it chest and head voice. It's more about perception. It's all happening right here and it's about resonance really. Uh, but that's why they're called that. Um, it's much easier to teach that way, right? It's like a teaching tool rather, you know, but people can get confused with that. But rather than um, being like, use your upper formant, uh, cluster formant style resonance or use that twang formant resonance, people are like, okay, that's way too heady for me right off the bat. So thus chest and head voice. So chest voice, just like what I did. Hey there, I'm talking on pitch. And then the other one is that's my head voice, right? So it's very light, floaty. You might notice that looks a little more draped. Um, so I often talk about like, this is how you, you might talk to your, your pet. You might be like, or, or a baby like, oh, hi, how's it going, right? That's sort of that head voicey place. Um, Ah, yes, that, you know, that might be um, something because it's such a big topic. It's something we would want to um, do sort of separately. And I, I think that'd be a good one to do in the future soon is like all about registration. Um, there, we have lots of videos on that too. So I highly recommend just sort of like um, sifting through what we have and, and see if you can find some stuff on mixing and chest mix. My, my best way of doing this like really quickly is to talk about vowels that are more common or easier to access certain registers. So like ah, these kinds of vowels are slightly lower formant, are gonna be easier in chest voice. And then these more narrow vowels like E and U um, are actually gonna help us access into head voice. And then finding those in the middle kind of vowels like A and uh, I, those are the vowels that actually help us sort of find the in-between place. And it's really just about a handoff of resonance and there's a little bit of an aerodynamics to it. So I've been one way I've been trying to explain mixed voice. Uh, it's pretty much advanced singing. It's your ability to get in and out of both registers and make them really almost it's make it almost impossible to tell which one you're switching to because they'll start to kind of resemble each other as they get closer and closer. So a smooth transition. Uh, and then the other thing is it's literally just different kinds of resonance mixing in our vocal tract. So why do we call it mixed voice? I think that's a nice way of ex explaining it. So what I would do is work on going from A ah to E, but try to keep a relatively similar shape with the front of your mouth and just let your tongue do most of the work moving from vowel to vowel. So I'll go like, and as you get better and better at that, you'll start to be able to sort of easily switch back and forth and then what i usually do is i will practice bringing it closer and closer like it's a lot easier to make changes between our registers when there's some distance so if i'm like 
na, ni, na. But if I bring it in closer and closer, na, ni, na, na, ni, na. that gets harder and harder to do. Um, you know, I practice trying to make it feel and look more and more effortless. That's part of the art form. But try that out on your own. And you, you know, and I, I've worked with a lot of students, and it takes some time to get that comfortable ability. So it's like, can I make my chest voice lighter and a little more dopey and maybe darker in tone as it gets closer to head voice? So if I'm like, ah, uh, I'm gonna crack, right? Or if I if I go. And I try to keep it back like that as I move to chest voice, that's going to crack down. But this leads me to another thing, right? It's that's we talk about that as like the dysfunction of the voice, but it's also like a style that people use all the time when we call it abrupt registration or yodeling. So if you're like singing here and then, yeah, up there, and then maybe you go, oh, a. So what I like to do is I'll take a vowel like a or ah, and then I will lean into the chest voice and then uh, bail up it, you know, so you kind of have to practice cracking, you know, go back and forth and be like, ah, 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 ah. very weird little sound to make, right? Ah, 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 ah. And you try to find that sort of placement, just like all of these things, right? What does it feel like to crack? Um, people are often scared of cracking and then they tend to do it more because we're trying to avoid it. So I'm always like own the crack and uh, learn how to do it on purpose intentionally. And then you're way less likely to actually crack unintentionally. So it's just this weird mind body kind of focused game. Um, but I'll, I'll practice sort of cracking up into head voice by uh, having a more wide vowel and then abruptly switching it to a smaller vowel. So it'll be like, play. Uh, and you can actually target where you jump to. So I might be like, uh, uh, and crack specifically to a place. And so you'll notice some singers are doing that, right? And um, so getting really, really um, detailed about it. Um, sometimes it cracks randomly. Sometimes people are just kind of adding in cracks all over the place and oh, hey, and like all these little things. And obviously that's kind of a weird, weird phrase that I was doing. But um, you might notice that some singers are really known by kind of riding goofy is the way I like to talk about it, where they're just kind of constantly coming in and out of the crack. Uh, and, and just like with grit, kind of like in intentional spots. Um, the other way is to crack down. Uh, this is uh, using a light head voice. Ah, and then um, trying to keep it in that light place until it has to bail into chest voice. So sometimes um, it happens so quickly and you can't hear it. Uh, but people go like, oh, oh. I'm actually starting with, oh, oh, yeah, right? Oh, oh. And trying to get that sort of crack to happen. So uh, you'd be surprised. Sometimes it just sounds really, really awesome when you do it in the right way. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And then you can really angle your crack to a specific spot. So that's what I actually recommend is get detailed with it, just like what you mentioned. So you may be like, ah, uh, eh, eh. And what it's really kind of like a mental thing. Like I'm thinking about the pitch here. sounds like a um sounds like a sort of horned like instrument um so we can do that um that's sort of practicing abrupt registration and cracking um and that can really make you have a unique sound um so you can see right we could fill up like a full hour of like what are different things that you can just do with your voice in general um and being aware of all of them just helps you sculpt something interesting and unique for whatever you're doing too right so just because you have a unique sound in one song doesn't mean that you, it has to be stuck that way for everything, right? I think of it as like being an instrument builder. I work in a style for the flavor of the week, whatever things I know I'm coming across. And I, I kind of just get my voice conditioned and ready for that um, so that I am in control of it. Otherwise, it's a very, it just gets very murky. And it's part of the reason why I think the voice can be really scary at first because we have so many options. It's really hard to know what you're doing and when and why. Um, and so a lot of it is just slowing down and um, trying to get really subtle. The sensations are hard to feel too. So we use our ears, we use visual cues, and, um, and we also can sometimes 
feel little subtle changes and things like that, but not always, right? So that's that game. Um, this actually leads me to another thing. I just sort of did what I was when I was going like, whoa, right? One thing also is just what are you doing musically, right? So stylistic choices that are musical, like are you sliding and scooping a lot? Are you adding in lots of riffs and turnarounds and things like that? Um, are you very riff happy or are you a pure melody kind of person? And I will pick and choose sometimes, right? Like sometimes I'm like, this song is so perfect just how it is. I don't need to add anything fancy. In fact, fancy stuff is going to distract people from the true emotion. And so you sit there and you make choices like, I'm just going to sing that melody and I'm going to sing it beautifully and heartfelt. And that's all you have to do. And then some songs, it'll feel weird if you do it like that, maybe a little dry and it just needs some vocalese and you know, like a little bit of some uh, some riffing here and there. And often with that, we use pentatonic riffs. They don't have to be, but that's like very, very common. You could also use diatonic riffs, which is just using your regular scale. But the pentatonic scale is a five note scale. Um, in major, it's one, two, three, skipping four. We go to five and six, and then we skip seven. So we skip four and seven, which have kind of very functional sound to them. And the best way that I can explain really quickly why pentatonic tends to work a lot of the time is because it's a little more ambiguous. Because when we don't have the four and the seven, it tends to just sort of fit into a lot of different scenarios. Um, so think of like a, a shape with more holes, right? So it just sort of can, you can piece it into things. Um, so here we have a pentatonic scale. Na, 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 na. So like you might be like, oh, yeah. We talk about like end note riffs and turnarounds going like, yeah, right? Doing that kind of stuff. Whoa. So, you know, you just fiddle around with riffing. I always talk about like, I just love um, sort of practicing riffing when I'm grocery shopping. I know it's sort of weird. And then people often I'll like turn an aisle and be like, Ooh, sorry, <laughs> that's really weird. But it's just because there's always like some silly, like kind of generic song of playing. And so I'm just like riffing to it. And I do it very light. You know, when we talk about agility, we talk about actually um, you want to be light and flexible. Uh, if you try to get too heavy with your sound, often it, it sort of smooths together and gets a little awkward. Um, so you might be like, I'm going to, I'm going to, riff all over the place on this song which is awesome um and then sometimes i might be like i'm not gonna do that much at all i'm just gonna sing it really beautifully and purely um and that can be a sort of something that makes your sound unique you know some people are known for just being very riff happy and some people are known for just not necessarily doing it that much right and so sometimes it's the quality of the the quality of your lyrics um or just the genre style and the energy level that you have so that's that one. Um, here's another one that I think is really interesting that I, I've just been hearing around. And um, it has to do a little bit with accent um, when I was talking about accent. But you can actually practice certain kinds of vowel modifications and pronunciation changes that give you a distinctive sound. Some people find this cringy. Some people really, really like it. And you may not even notice that's happening sometimes. Uh, but there are there's certain sort of things that'll happen. Um, some of the obvious ones are like, we don't pronounce all the words all the time when we're singing, right? Like, so the classic one we talk about is we don't go like running a lot of times, we go like running. Um, sometimes we'll even get like, so for example, in like a rock sound, instead of like going to me or you, we go me and yo, right? And it's just like a super loose, like that's me, that's yo, right? And it's like, oh, eh. Right. So I'm actually literally substituting a different vowel for what should be there. Right. So I'm, that's me. That's me. Right. That's me. That's you. And so instead of E, it's A. And instead of U, it's A. Uh, right. And so we get more neutral kinds of vowels. Here's another one that's really interesting. Um, and, I, you know, there I can name some singers who probably who are doing this maybe intentionally or not intentionally. But I call it the the oi sound. So O I. And uh, it's kind of like with a W, but instead of like nerve, you might go like knife, knife, right? And you're kind of creating this like little like um, saucy little sound, right? Where um, so like 
foy foy you instead of like um it just, it just feels weird but when you'll you'll notice that some singers then that actually changes the the shape of a lot of their vowels as they're sort of chewing it a little bit so like knife for um, more and it's you're getting like that little ring of resonance and that can create like a certain kind of cutesy sound um i <laughs> i don't know if you if you've seen that or noticed it but um i kind of like it right I, again it's not i'm not trying to diss anything it's just for certain kinds of sounds and certainly more of like a pop contemporary and kind of younger sound we get that Ooh. and then actually um it used to be sort of like an old like um kind of sound too right like a, a little more of like the flapper girl kind of kind of a vibe like black and white sort of kind of what i'm thinking about there um so you can actually substitute vowels sometimes and just make sure that it's understandable but um some of this actually just happens naturally because of the accent too right so i'm not trying to like um criticize just trying to point out that like these little subtleties make very distinctive kinds of sounds right um so a rocker might have more of that neutral uh instead of e and uh instead of ooh. uh and then if you're going a little bit more like that you know you're going to have a little more work in here and that's going to create um that kind of particular overtone sound um yeah so this is these are kind of the main ones that i i wanted to talk about and just to review because it's a lot to play with we've got breathy to ringing sound. We've got nasal to non-nasal. We've got straight tone and vibrato. And then we've got the size of our vibrato and the um, stability or evenness of the vibrato. Is it a wobble or is it a flutter? We've got clean tone to grit sound to fry sound and all the things in between that. We've got bright to dark tone, which often has to do with vowel shapes. Um, we've got abrupt to smooth register transitions. We've got cracking and yodeling um, or doing more of a mixed voice kind of a sound. We've got pure melody singers and we've got riff happy singers uh, and everything in between. And um, the kinds of riffs that you do also kind of give people a certain sort of sound. So do you do a lot of turnarounds? What's your go-to riff, right? That's something I, I noticed. Like, for example, I love using turnarounds all the time for some reason. It just feels really good to sort of be like, yeah, whoa, and doing that kind of thing. Um, do you do lots of five note riffs like what I just did, right? Oh, that kind of a thing. Or, or do you do like seven, 13 note riffs and just go all over your register, which is really awesome. Um, do you do something with your vowel pronunciation that's specific to uh, the language that you speak? Or is it an intentional just sort of like um, character voice that you add into what you're doing? Um, and, you know, and this is the other thing is that, like I love it when singers go in and out of different languages. I think that leads to a lot of really cool um, changes of timbre and quality and just flow of sound. So that can also be something that makes you uh, a unique and distinctive singer is like, you know, repping your native language and going back and forth. Um, I love trying to, to sing in different languages in general. It's part of like a, our, you know, classical music training. We, we learn different languages, um, choral music, you tend to sing in a number of different languages and it just shapes the whole quality of the sound and um, the different kinds of vocal techniques that you might come across. Uh, so there's that. Um, there's also very distinctive cultural styles of singing, right? Like I, I mentioned, throat singing, which can be found in a number of cultures, and that's um, a whole style, overtone singing. Um, and so, you know, pay attention to that, like, you know, use your ear and go listen to different things. And uh, that can really influence how you do stuff. That's sort of most of them. And then I guess the last thing I wanted to sort of talk about is what's cool is ultimately, like, you might be like, oh, my gosh, I have no idea where to begin. I, um, this is, too much information, right? These are just options and it's pay attention to what you tend to do and what your sort of, yeah, what your tendencies are and what feels most comfortable and start from there. And I just like to point out that we're all different Our, you know, yeah, like our, our DNA is pretty all similar as humans, but the shape of our bodies, um, it's gonna, there's gonna be subtle variations and all of these things are gonna give you a unique sound. When we talk about timbre, um, that term of like, you know, changing tone and timbre, uh, it has, you know, what does, what does that really mean? It's like whenever we are singing or speaking or any sound, 
it's not just one vibration or sound. It's a disbursement of vibrations at different proportions. So like it's the difference between my voice and someone else's voice or my voice and a cello or another instrument. They're all going to have a different disbursement and timbre. We can learn to shape that, but we do have some natural state of our, you know, a uniqueness in our sound. Uh, and that uh, is sort of something that, you know, I find like when through vocal technique, when I can just find my pure voice, I know that that voice is going to be unique because it's me. It's my voice in the shape of my body. And, um, and so that's something that also you can, you can do with all of this. You know, we talked, I spent most of the time talking about this sort of construction based method, critical listening skills, and trying to sort of play with these different opposites. But there's also just vocal technique in general. And vocal technique for me is about, uh, is freeing. So like technique should free you up to sound like yourself um, first and foremost, and that's really healthy. And then from there you could shape it and do all sorts of things. But I always, you know, like, especially with like young singers, like I'm always a little concerned when I hear a young singer trying to sound a lot older than they are um, by, you know, and not just like a character voice. Sometimes we do that right for fun for, for certain shows and things like that. But like, as your default sound, it's like, you know, oh, like that singer sounds like they're like a 50 year old opera singer. And it's like, but they they are a kid and they should sort of sound like a kid. Um, so sometimes you just want to be careful that your technique isn't trying to force your voice into a certain place uh, because it can lead to um, vocal tension uh, in the in the future. And I mean this by like your like OG kind of authentic voice. Um, and so I, I talk about just sort of like what is the most free sound that you can make, relaxed and free, and that's going to uh, that's going to sound like you. Uh, and it's amazing that you know all our voices sound have variations of sound. And you you might know some people who have very distinctive voice um, and maybe start to think about like what makes their voice distinct, what makes your voice distinct. Uh, and some of that stuff we can shape and change, but some of it is just built into us. Um, yeah, yes, it really, you know, so like the way I like to think about it, um, so some singers are like, I have a style and a way of singing. That's really great. Um, you sort of like paint with certain colors and a certain kind of shape. But ultimately, like I find to be a really versatile artist and vocal artist by that. Um, yeah, I might start to think like, okay, what makes up this style and the song that I'm singing? And also what kind of technical style helps me execute what I'm doing? So oftentimes style and technique, there's this beautiful merging of the two where like I'm having trouble technically singing this certain song. Oh, it's because my style choices are, are weird. And it's actually making it almost impossible because of the way that I'm singing it. Like classical singers do this sometimes when they're trying to sing contemporary music. And it's like, you're not gonna be able to get that riff with that sort of wide, full vibrato -y kind of sound. It's too heavy, it's too um, too open, whatever that is. Um, so it really, it really depends. And so a lot of times, yeah, I'm thinking, you know, what genre am I singing? What kind of stylistic choices could I make? Um, what's the quality of that? And, uh, you know, there's obviously going to be variation within that, but um, those kinds of choices are, are really, really important. And I'll do that as like active listening and audiating before I even jump in and try, try to start singing a song. I might be like listening, analyzing how a singer is executing it, what's their strategy. Um, if I don't have that, it's, I'm also just thinking about the chord types and the um, instruments being played and then uh, what to do from there. So I'm not saying that there's a a right answer here, but I just think that when we get a little more intentional, we often uh, can sort of puzzle master our way through a situation and then make a song feel way more effortless or just uh, way more in style. Um, yeah, and, and, and just like what you're mentioning here too, like the speed of a song, it might change the way that you want to do things um, and the range of where it sits might change what you want to do. And then of course, you know, you can move a song around in your range to make it fit better with the style that you like. So a lot of people will take a song and cover it and sort of retrofit it to a style that that fits for them. And that can be a really, really cool way to do cover song styles. Um, so yeah, that's that's mainly this, this whole topic here. Hopefully this has been helpful. Uh, and the main point is just to explore uh, what our, your voice can do in a healthy way, pay attention to to how it feels um, and listen, you know, listen to music, listen to your favorite artists and 
and start to think a little more critically about like what's the strategy they use how does their sound work you you'll you'll find that there are some really interesting things like there's some singers who are creating really really interesting little character voices that just sort of like pull your attention um you know i, I like i like to think of like um Big Thief or Bjork or, you know, some of these singers that have like a very distinctive tone quality that we can immediately kind of think about. Um, so, or um, Coco Rosie, if you don't know that one, there's a, it's a really interesting kind of like witchy voice that comes into play sometimes. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, you know, I know we're just at the end here, but does anyone else have um, some, some artists that they know, you know, you can also put in the comments like that you think have a very distinctive voice that, um, you'd like to sort of make a shout out to uh that's you know that's the other side of this is like we just have to use our ear and explore music out there uh and then from there you'll start to develop a, a unique style and ultimately because it's you and you're making the choices and there's no one like you you you'll find that that unique style for yourself and so some of it is like i'm giving people options because this journey isn't as linear as we'd like right we we find our style through the music we create, the music that we sing. And there are many artists whose style shifts and changes throughout the years, right? As they continue to develop as an artist and, and explore new options. Um, you're very welcome. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed and I will um, see you next time. I'm, I'm gonna keep in mind sort of what uh, everyone wants to sort of see next. Maybe we'll do some stuff with registration. That could be a really great, more technical topic. Lots of exercises to try. Um, so I look forward to next time and good luck on your singing journey. Take care, everybody.